What's going on everybody? This is Dean with Blue Ridge Overland Gear and today I'm going to come at you with three tips for installing a 12 volt fridge into your vehicle. Now there are three common things that a lot of people are worried about. First, how do I keep my food cold? Second, how can I keep the fridge running without killing my starter battery and leaving me stranded? And then third, how can I keep that fridge safe and secure in the back of my vehicle without toppling over? So those are kind of the three main questions that we're gonna answer. And then we're also gonna give you a couple other tips and tricks along the way. The first thing everybody's concerned about is keeping their food cold. The whole reason of switching to a 12 volt fridge is getting rid of ice. So you wanna make sure that your food is going to stay cold. So the first thing you need to do when switching to a 12 volt fridge is kind of the same thing you did with a cooler. You wanna limit the amount of times you're opening and closing the fridge because the more you open and close it, the more that cold air bleeds out, more warm air gets in, and then the fridge is just gonna have to cycle again. So you wanna kind of get in the habit of only being in the fridge when you absolutely need to. The other good tip is, again, the same thing you did when you had a cooler, which was pack your food accordingly. The things you want the coldest, your meats, your cheeses, and your drinks, also the heaviest things, they go down in the bottom of the fridge because cold air sinks. The things that maybe don't need as much cold air, your vegetables and maybe some things that don't need necessarily need to be frozen, can go up at the top. And that way, as air cycles, you know, the cold air is going to go to the bottom. It's going to keep those things colder longer. So the second thing that everybody's concerned about is making sure the fridge doesn't kill the starter battery in their vehicle and leave them stranded. Because the last thing you want to be is out camping and have cold food, but a dead battery. And eventually, because you have a dead battery, you're not going to have any more cold food. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing is most of the reputable brands all have a built-in low voltage cutoff, meaning that when the fridge detects the battery get, getting to a certain level, it's gonna automatically shut itself off, so it's not going to kill your battery. So if you have a fridge, it's plugged directly into your main battery, you can set it at the high level, meaning when the battery gets down to a certain level, the fridge is gonna go, oh, okay, I'm gonna shut off. If you're a little bit more aggressive or you have a bigger battery or a standalone battery, you can set it at a medium or a low setting, meaning that fridge will run the battery down a little bit more, but eventually it's gonna to get to a point to where it's not gonna kill that battery by draining that battery all the way to zero. For a Dometic fridge, the high setting is 11.8, the mid setting is 11.2 and the low setting is 10.8. Those are all in volts. For an ARB fridge, it's 11.8, 11.4 and 10.1 respectively for high, middle and low. Some of the newer fridges on the market like Dometic's CFX line also have their own monitoring app, meaning you can actually adjust the settings and monitor to the health of your fridge and your battery from your phone. Welcome to the 21st century. In that app, you can look at your settings. If it's a dual zone fridge, you can adjust the temperatures on the two different zones. You can also shut a particular zone off. You can adjust the low voltage cutoff. There's a lot of cool things that you can do with that app. Now, to give you guys a couple different examples of how you can incorporate a fridge into your trips and also how to not kill your battery, we're gonna start with a level one trip. Now, a level one trip, if you remember, is when you're gonna be spending most of your time, quote unquote, on the grid. So you're gonna have access to emergency services like AAA. So for me, when I plug my fridge into my battery, if I kill the battery, it's gonna be a minor inconvenience, but I can call up AAA and get a jump start. You can also carry jumper cables or a jumper box just in case. But again, remember, if you're running it off your starter battery, make sure to set that low voltage cutoff into the high setting and you will most likely not kill that battery, but you do wanna make sure that your battery is in good condition. Now, for a level two trip where you're gonna be spending a little bit of time off of the grid, but a lot of time on the grid, you can get a portable battery system like this. So this is a PLB40 by Dometic, um, and it's designed to run their fridge for up to two days. And what's really nice about this is it's got a lot of different sockets on it, meaning you can plug the fridge in, you can plug lights in, you could charge batteries and things like that. But also on the back, it's got different inputs where you can plug it into your vehicle, charge it off the alternator. You can also charge it off solar. So there's a lot of different options. Now for a more detailed review on this, you can click the link down below for our product review video of the PLB40 by Dometic. In addition to the PLB40, there are other portable battery systems out there by companies like Goal Zero, 
also by Midland that have just these portable battery banks, which give you a lot of different options for plugging in things like fridges, charging radios, cell phones, camera batteries, drone batteries. Now, the advantage of these standalone batteries is you are not molesting the wiring harness of your vehicle, meaning if you have a newer vehicle and you don't wanna cut into it or you're just not confident into cutting into your vehicle's electrical system, these standalone batteries use standard plugs and can plug into cigarette lighters and 12 volt adapters. You can strap them down in the back. You don't have to worry about cutting into your vehicle's electrical system or anything like that. They're also portable. It's a whole idea, meaning you can actually take them from vehicle to vehicle or even take them out of your vehicle and put them in your campsite, meaning if you want to take your fridge out of your vehicle with the battery system, you can do that. So there's a lot of flexibility in that that you're not gonna get into with a built-in system. Also, if your vehicle is your daily driver, it means you can take the fridge and the battery out of the vehicle Monday through Friday when you're going back and forth to work. And then when you're gonna go out on the weekends, you can take the fridge and the battery, put it in, everything's ready to go. Now for a level three trip where you are gonna be spending an extended amount of time off grid and your trip is gonna be of a much longer duration, that's where you're gonna to wanna to get into something what's known as a house battery. And a house battery is a standalone battery that powers the house accessories, things like your fridge, your lighting, your ventilation system, charging your accessories. And the nice thing about this house battery system is it is independent of your main vehicle's electrical system and that starter battery, meaning if that battery were to go dead, you are still gonna have a starting battery that's gonna be able to start the vehicle, run, drive, and get you out of wherever you are. One of the popular things on the off-road market is a dual battery system. This actually puts two batteries under the hood of your vehicle, links them together, and then has an isolator in there. That is not necessarily the best option for a house battery system. Your better deep cycle batteries, like a lithium battery, for instance, don't like extreme temperatures. They don't like to be very hot and they don't like to be very cold. Meaning if it's under the hood and under hood temperatures can reach anywhere from 250 to 300 degrees, yeah, that's not good for the battery. Also under the hood of the vehicle, when the vehicle is not running, it can get very, very cold because it's gonna get out to ambient temperature. Meaning if you live in a place where it snows, it's below freezing, the battery doesn't like that. That's why if you've ever had, you know, those cold mornings where you go to start your vehicle and go, well, it's because it's not putting out optimum voltage or amperage. Also your deep cycle batteries, uh, usually need a higher voltage to charge, which is not gonna be coming from the alternator in an ideal manner. So the battery under your hood never really reaches 100% charge. Now that's really not that big a deal because again, you're just starting the vehicle every now and then and the alternator is gonna charge it up. But when you start doing these deep cycles and you're constantly going down into the depth, that middle part of the battery, those cycles, eventually what happens is, is if you're not fully charging it, you eventually lower the ceiling and your battery goes from 100% capacity when it's new to after a couple months, it might be at 95% capacity. A couple months later, it's at 90% capacity. And then a little bit later, it's down to 80% capacity. And after three or four years, you might be down to only 75% capacity of your battery. And that's what happens when people say, oh, I bought a $300 battery and it's bad after two years. Well, they weren't charging, conditioning and maintaining it, which is where you're gonna want a DC to DC charger, like you find with Red Arc or Renogy or Blue Sea, one of those companies, because what that DC to DC charger is gonna do is it's gonna take the irregular voltage that's coming out of your vehicle's alternator, gonna step that voltage up to the 14.4, 14.5, 14.6, whatever that manufacturer or the battery requires. And it's gonna be able to maintain that and it's gonna optimize it to keep that battery healthy charged, conditioned, and also maintained. And you're not gonna get that from a standard dual battery system that's up under the hood of your vehicle. That's why so many people say, I invested in this deep cycle AGM battery and it went bad after two or three years. Well, that's because for the two or three years, it wasn't being optimally maintained. If you're gonna invest the money into a standalone house battery, spend the money to get a DC to DC charger. Now, there are some DC to DC chargers out there that will not only charge off of the vehicle's alternator, but they will also charge off of solar. And there are even some out there that will do off the alternator, off of solar, or even 120 volt uh, shore power. Meaning if you're at a campground or your house or an Airbnb, you can just plug into a wall outlet and that single charger will again, charge condition and maintain that battery, keeping it at optimal health. And although it's a little bit of a heavier uh, cost upfront, 
over the long haul, especially for those of you doing those long distance trips that are off grid, it'll pay for itself in the long run. So again, this is a, a heavy investment and that's one of the reasons why if all you're doing is level one or level two trips, you really don't need to make the investment into a house battery system in a DC charger. Just get something like a PLB40 or just know you're gonna be running off your starter battery. So set that voltage at the high level um, so your fridge doesn't kill your battery. Now the third and final thing that we are going to talk about is gonna be keeping the fridge secure, keeping it from toppling over or just bouncing around in the back of your vehicle. Now, most fridge manufacturers have their own brand of straps, ARB, Dometic, they all have their own straps. They work great. There are also some third-party straps on the market like Tembo Tusk or us he here at Brog. We even make our own straps, which we're gonna be covering in another video, which you can find via the link down below. Another option for mounting and securing your fridge is going to be a slide. So right here. Now these slides come in three popular styles. One like this is a straight slide, meaning the fridge just comes straight out. There is also a tilting slide, meaning if you have it up on like a set of bed drawers or something like that, it'll slide and it'll tilt out. There is also a drop slide which the fridge will actually come out and it'll stay level, but it'll drop up and down. Um, so those are kind of the three most popular. And again, those will have straps that hold them down or some of them have a plate system which bolts to the bottom of the fridge. Now, me personally, simpler is better. So I don't like the ones that do a whole lot of moving around. Also, one of the things to look for is when your slides um, see how they lock. Some of them will only lock when they're on the in position. Um, I like ones that will lock both in and out, meaning if your vehicle is slightly downhill, you're not constantly fighting gravity with it trying to suck your fridge back in. Now, one of the things to be mindful of when you have a slide is cable management, because basically that fridge needs to be plugged in, but it also needs to be able to move, meaning you're probably gonna have anywhere from a foot and a half to three feet of cable as that fridge slides in and out. So you need to make sure that it's not gonna get pinched in the slide mechanism or pinched behind the fridge, or that as that plug slides back, you're not gonna impact the plug on anything in the back of your vehicle. So a couple little tricks that I like to use is number one, a little bit of a bungee cord, is you can kind of hook it to that um, cord and hook the bungee up somewhere else. So as it comes into slack, that bungee pulls it up. You can also get coiled cables, meaning it's gonna kind of be like those old telephone cables that kind of just spring back and forth and kind of keep themselves tucked out of the way. So that kind of wraps up the three main things that a lot of people are worried about, but we're going to throw a couple bonus things at you. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is utilizing the space around the fridge. As you can see here, we actually have a couple things that hang off the handles, like our cooking kit bag, um, or you can use sticky Velcro for these Velcro pouches, or up top, we actually have one of our 12 by 12 uh, universal mounting panels with um, two pouches attached to it. Um, just because you can kind of utilize this dead space, but you want to remember, don't block the vents. I'm going to say that one more time because somebody out there is going to do this. Don't block the vents, okay? So as you notice, there's nothing on this side of the fridge because that's the side where the vents are. So when you're mounting your fridge inside of a vehicle, if you're gonna be doing something like a cubby system like this, even if you're using a drawer or whatever, is to kind of give yourself a little bit of space around the fridge, both top, down the sides, and around back, just to kind of give you a little bit of an air void to allow air circulation for that vent. Also, again, it'll give you a little bit of room for things like those pouches that we showed off earlier. The last thing that we wanna talk about is those of you who are gonna be going on, again, those long distance trips. It is inevitable that there will be some sort of electrical gremlin that's gonna creep up. It could be a pinched cable, it could be a blown fuse, it could be a bad plug. So one of the things I always recommend to people if you have a fridge and you're gonna be traveling for an extended period of time is have some sort of basic electrical repair kit. Now, you don't need to be an electrical engineer, you don't have to carry your own soldering iron or anything crazy like that. But again, maybe carrying a spare cable, couple extra fuses, maybe a spare plug or socket, just to you know troubleshoot some of those common problems which occur. Because again, you may not mean to, but you might accidentally pinch your cord and then your fridge shuts off. Ask me how I know, it happens to the best of us. Um, so again, I speak from experience, carry a spare cord and don't block the vents. So hopefully you found this fridge install video helpful. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. 
If there's any questions that you might have that we didn't answer, or maybe you have a tip that we didn't think of, please drop them down in the comments below. Also make sure to check out the show notes for other links to other videos and products that we talked about in this video. Thank you for watching.